record. It's the name you think of when you need to secure a piece of wood to your workbench. Perhaps the greatest record model number in woodworking history is the 52 and a half. It was the largest woodworking vice that record produced, unless of course you've got the 53, which is a little bit larger, but potatoes, potatoes. In the 1900s, record produced four distinct versions. What happened in the early 2000s will not be spoken of. What are the differences between the versions and which version is the best? Let's get to the bottom of these pressing issues. This version was first produced in 1918 under the registered design 664709. Interestingly, this particular unit may be among one of the first that record produced as it is missing the Made in England stamp. In the 1930s version, introduced approximately in 1932-1933, the registered design number is retained, we have a Made in England stamp and we have the addition of a faceplate nubbin. This was incorporated into the cast to provide extra room for the new quick release spring mechanism. In the 1940s version, introduced perhaps after World War II, Record eliminated the registered design number from the faceplate as it was no longer valid. In addition, the Made in England stamp has been moved to the base of the fins. Also, the roundover of the 1930s rostrum has been replaced by a more aggressive right angle design. In this version, note the kerfing of the rail slide ends. The 1960s ushered in, amongst other things, the greatest change to the geometry of the faceplate. The nubbin is gone, we have a change in the location of the Made in England stamp, and we have a complete overhaul in the geometry of the faceplate fins. Considering the side edge of the faceplates, it is evident that the 1960s version is wider. The 1940s version is slightly wider than the 1930s, and the 1930s is about the same thickness as the 1920s version. When we take a look at the rear side, however, we can see that a lot of iron has been taken out of the 1960s version when compared to the 1930s version. Notice the thickness of the bottom edge. What does this all mean, however? Let's have a look at a comparison of the faceplate statistics. With the introduction of each new version, both the average weight and the average thickness of the faceplate has become greater. The reason for the low weight value of the 1920s unit is that its rail slides are thinner when compared to those of the other versions. Let's take a first look at our version comparison chart and after an evaluation of the faceplate unit the clear standout is the 1960s version. Let's have a look at the base box of each unit. The base box of the 1920s unit is large as it houses the quick release spring. You can even see it protruding when viewed from a face plate perspective. In the 1930s version, the quick release spring is located at the back of the face plate. As a consequence, the rail slide housing is smaller. There is very little difference, if any, in the 1940s version. And in the 1960s iteration, things got radical. We now have a monster cutout in the slide housing. With this version, and with the bar bracket removed, it is possible to inspect both slide rails and the thread while the vise is mounted under the bench. This undoubtedly makes it easier from a maintenance perspective. One important thing to note is that the geometry and distances between the base mounting holes of both the 20s and 60s versions is different. This means that they cannot be a drop-in replacement for one another. They also can't be a drop-in replacement for either the 30s or 40s versions, as these two have a different mounting hole geometry. Another difference we can see in the 1960s version is the thickness of the base plate. Looking at the thread nut housings, in the 1920s version the cavity remained open and there was no provision for an inspection plate. In the 1930s and 40s versions 
an inspection cover was included. This serves little practical use as when mounted underneath the bench it is inaccessible. And in the 1960s record did away with the inspection plate altogether. Having a look at the finish at the back of the faceplate, you can see that it was pretty rough in the 1930s. Someone certainly took their time with attention to detail in the 1940s. The 1960s version is also nice and smooth. Notice here too that record did away with the strength fins at the back of the rear clamp plate. This undoubtedly makes installation easier as no longer is there a necessity to hack big slot trenches into your bench. Let's have a look at the statistics of the base slide housing. Of note is the greater average rear plate thickness of the 1960s version. However, we must account for the elimination of the rear plate strength fins. Ease of installation of the 1960s unit is certainly worth a star. However, ultimate base box kudos must go to the 1920s, 30s and 40s versions due to increased strength of both the rear clamp plate and because they don't have the huge cavity cutout, the slide housing itself. I notice that in the 1920s version there is a lot of play in the thread nut. There is almost zero play in the 1930s version and this definitely matters when you're trying to clamp with one hand. Similarly there is very little play in both the 1940s and 1960s versions. Although this might seem like a minor detail it is definitely worthy of a star. Having a look at the rail stay and the difference is clear. We have a lovely cast iron piece in the 1920s, 30s and 40s versions. In the 1960s, aesthetic beauty gave way to economics as our cast iron moulding was exchanged for steel plate. Although less spectacular, there is no difference in strength. There was no difference to the threaded rods that I could see. However, interestingly, I noticed that in the 1920s version, the knob had been welded to the threaded rod. From the 1930s version onward, the knob and the threaded rod were cut from a single piece of steel. Having a look at the thread nuts, they're all fairly similar, apart from the 1920s version being slightly smaller and the rougher cast of the 1960s unit. Having a closer look at the bar keep, we have a beautiful piece of cast iron in the 1930s unit. In the 1940s, Record replaced the cast iron with a two-piece unit, pressed steel and a nice little steel cone upon which the quick-release bar pivots. In the 1960s, Record increased the size of the bracket to accommodate the larger cavity. 
let's talk about big knobs. And here we have a beautiful, curvaceous, aesthetically pleasing looking knob of the 20s, 30s and 40s versions. It's the kind of knob that you don't pass by without wanting to grab, fiddle with, explore. Ooh, that's a nice knob. What's this? In the 1960s, the beautiful curvaceous knob gave way to the blunt, cylindrical, stubby looking knob. It's the kind of knob that you want to use after watching Rambo First Blood. The beautiful knobs of the 20s, 30s and 40s had both function and form, whereas the knob of the 1960s, it was all about function. When you're using a beautiful curvaceous knob of a vise from the 1920s, 30s or 40s, you might only be building a block of shells from MDF, but you're thinking of E-type jags and dining tables. However, when you're handling the stubby knob of the 1960s, even though there might be no grand feelings of nostalgia, you really do get an overwhelming appreciation of just how much clamping force this unit can administer. Although I'm not the kind of guy to get hung up on shaft length, I'm very impressed with the 1920s unit that puts the other versions to shame. Any category revolving around aesthetics is purely subjective, I know, but I'm giving my vote to the 1940s version. The uncluttered faceplate, the curvaceous knob, the colour, it just all works for me. The levers are pretty similar other than the reversed position of the fin on the 1960s. This may seem like a minor detail, but in the 1960s unit, Record has placed the strength fin on the underside of the lever, meaning it's nice and smooth when you grab it. It is evident that Record has considered a lot of things in the 1960s version. They've addressed the finer details, and that certainly is worth a star. Interestingly, the lever shaft of the 1960s version looks like it is cast iron, whereas in all the other models, the lever shaft is cut from steel rod. There is very little difference in the springs, other than their positioning behind the faceplate. Regarding the lever bar, the 1920s version is noticeably smaller than the others. Let's have a look at the overall weight of each version. It is evident that the 1960s version is the heaviest. It has the most iron in the faceplate and it also has the heaviest base box to compensate for the elimination of the strength fins. Considering overall strength, I'm giving two stars each to both the 1930s and 1940s versions and I'm giving one star to the 1960s version. Due to the massive cavity cutout, it just isn't quite as strong. The 1940s version is a standout for me. It has curves where they need to be, but it's not overstated. The faceplate is a smorgasbord of uncluttered glory. It has a handmade refinement. No need of a sterile machine finish here. It's not that there's anything wrong with the 1920s version as I have no doubt that with this vice, you could probably build a wharf for an aircraft carrier. But it's just that with any of the versions that followed, you could build a bigger wharf. There is very little difference in the 1930s, 40s and 60s versions. They all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. When it was all said and done, I separated them by looks. How superficial of me. But I believe the look of the 1940s version evoked a certain emotion, emotion of appreciation. And isn't that just the way in life? And don't get me wrong, I appreciate all the versions of this wonderful, wonderful vice that Record made in the 1900s. It's just that I appreciate the 1940s version the most.